Y'all can't send none of y'all meat mills, y'all puffies, y'all little boozies, none of these names. None of these people that have to listen to y'all because they're dealing with, they have legal, I never killed nobody, right? I'm the that never killed nobody, right? But that means I can say whatever I want and not go to jail. I feel like anything with her name on it is strictly for the purposes of financial gain for those who have access to her estate, including Clive Davis. Most including Clive Davis. Clive. Davis. This ain't a... It's Meek Mills, no. Puff Daddy, whoever, none of these s***s. All you fake hard s***s, f*** you. Wait, Come, wait, no, no, wait. hold on, hold on. Okay. All you fake hard s***s, f*** you. Kanye West has dropped a bombshell as he just exposed how Diddy and Clive Davis exploited and mistreated young artists in the industry. If you've ever wondered about the origins of Diddy's shady reputation amidst the swirling rumors, it seems there may finally be an answer. Word on the street suggests that Clive Davis, the influential figure in the music industry, could be the mastermind behind Diddy's villainous behavior. Rumor has it that Davis mentored Diddy in the dark arts of manipulation, how to exploit people for their talents and bodies, only to discard them once they've served their purpose or cease to be profitable. If these whispers are to be believed, Clive Davis might be even more twisted than Diddy himself. Considering the numerous accusations against Diddy, that's saying something. Let's delve into the enduring speculation surrounding the tragic demise of Whitney Houston. Kanye recently touched upon a controversial theory suggesting that Hollywood elites might orchestrate celebrity deaths to appear as suicides. Because you can't shoot nobody anyway, and the reason why you got talks because you did a deal, you fed. You know what I'm saying? That's why you gotta come at me, cause part of the deal for you to be a do all that rah, 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 and get out of jail is that you promise that you gonna go pull my coat co car. So y'all niggas shut the f up about me. Now let me say it calm. Fans are now echoing this sentiment, particularly concerning Whitney's passing. Notably, shortly after Whitney was found in her hotel room's bathtub, her mentor Clive Davis hosted a pre-Grammy party at the same venue. Allegations suggest that Davis was aware of Whitney's presence in the building at the time. It has been 11 years since Whitney Houston, arguably one of the greatest vocalists of all time, left us, yet her fans continue to yearn for clarity regarding the circumstances of her death. Numerous conspiracy theories swirl around Whitney Houston's last days, but a prominent narrative links her mentor and record producer Clive Davis to the controversy. This theory gained traction after Kanye West shed light on the darker aspects of the music industry, alleging that Hollywood executives orchestrated a system to exploit and profit from celebrities' trauma. Amidst this renewed scrutiny, fans of Whitney Houston resurrected discussions surrounding Clive Davis's notorious 2012 pre-Grammy party. Many speculate that Davis may have had a role in Houston's untimely demise. Jaguar Wright also thinks the same. He needed her back. Oh, yeah. He needed her back, but he needed her back and under his control. You wanna know what Clive Davis did for Whitney Houston? Why he was busy trying to bring her back? See, people forget before she came to the United States, he sent her on an international tour. Mm. And she went out on tour and she was still getting high at the time. To provide some background, Whitney Houston passed away on February 11th, 2012, coinciding with the day she was scheduled to perform at Clive Davis's pre-Grammy awards party at the Beverly Hilton Hotel in Beverly Hills. Shortly before the anticipated event, Whitney's assistant made a distressing discovery, Whitney lying motionless in a bathtub filled with water. With Whitney unresponsive, the assistant urgently contacted Whitney's bodyguard, Ray Watson, seeking assistance to remove her from the tub. Ray stood before the mirror, recounting the harrowing events that transpired in the bathroom. The scene felt like something out of a surreal nightmare, and panic gripped him as he struggled to comprehend Whitney's condition. Was she alive, or had she succumbed to the unfathomable? I pulled her from the water, desperately trying to revive her, Ray recounted, his voice tinged with disbelief. Amidst the chaos, Whitney's assistant and bodyguard sprang into action, dialing 911 as the urgency of the situation became palpable. The paramedics arrived promptly at Whitney's hotel room, the clock ticking ominously. At 3.30 p.m., they initiated CPR, fighting against time to resuscitate her fading life force. Despite their efforts, the inevitable conclusion loomed over the room. At 3.55 p.m., Whitney Houston was officially declared departed, leaving a void that echoed with the sorrow of an industry and a generation. The circumstances surrounding Whitney Houston's death remained shrouded in mystery initially, with local law enforcement unable to ascertain any clear intentions. However, following an extensive autopsy and toxicology analysis, the L.A. County Coroner's Office determined that her passing was attributed to drowning, compounded by underlying heart disease and substance use. 
Despite the autopsy's notation of physical trauma, the coroner dismissed any indications of foul play. Yet Whitney's devoted fans couldn't shake the feeling of suspicion lingering around the incident. Their unease escalated when it was revealed that Clive Davis proceeded with his pre-Grammy party at the Beverly Hilton despite Whitney's demise. Consider this. In a moment of reflection, it's striking to realize that amidst Whitney Houston's passing, her long-standing mentor and other celebrities seemed unaffected, joyously dancing and reveling while her body lay above them in the banquet room. Clive, her mentor, asserted that continuing the party was a tribute to Whitney, arguing it was what she would have desired, despite no explicit request from her family to cancel the event. However, numerous acquaintances and relatives of Whitney have since stepped up to express their dismay over Clive's actions, citing them as a blatant disregard for Whitney's memory. Chaka Khan, a close friend of Whitney for years, described Clive's choice to host a party at the very hotel where Whitney passed away mere hours before as utterly nonsensical. She emphasized that such a decision contradicted everything Whitney stood for, asserting that Whitney's true desires would have been the polar opposite of such a celebration. Chaka Khan didn't hold back her criticism towards Clive, questioning the sincerity behind labeling the gathering as a tribute to Whitney. In her view, it seemed inconceivable that someone who professed love and concern for Whitney could muster the energy to party mere hours after her passing. Furthermore, there were murmurs suggesting Whitney might have suffered physical harm prior to her death. While the official autopsy report remained silent on this matter, various industry figures including Jaguar Wright, alleged that Whitney's family observed signs of trauma on her body. Moreover, amidst all these events, a recently unearthed video has been circulating on social media. It depicts Whitney Houston unexpectedly interrupting an interview between Brandy and Clive Davis merely two days before her tragic demise. In a mysterious gesture, she passes a confidential note to Brandy, the contents of which remain unknown to this day. Speculation suggests it might have been a cautionary message concerning Clive. Adding to the tragedy, just three years following Whitney's death, her sole child, Bobby Christina Brown, also met a similar fate, mirroring the circumstances of her mother's passing. Oh, um, she's dead. Ray J was the last person to see her alive. He let the dealer in, but she was sober, right? But he let the dealer in that gave her the shot. Leola has said, Leola Brown, Bobby Brown's sister, has said on several occasions that her she was beat. They saw her body. She didn't just die in a tub, like. On the last day of January 2015, Bobby's ex-fiancee, Nick Gordon, along with another companion, discovered Bobby unconscious in a bathtub at her residence in Georgia. Despite still being alive upon the paramedic's arrival, Bobby was placed into a medically induced coma. Tragically, after remaining in this state for nearly half a year, Bobby passed away on July 26, 2015, at the tender age of 22. The initial autopsy conducted by the IAL revealed no clear underlying cause of death or significant injuries. However, it was later disclosed that the primary cause of Bobby's demise was immersion-related, compounded by intoxication. Yet, the manner of her death could not be definitively determined. The autopsy report explicitly stated the medical examiner's inability to ascertain whether the incident was intentional or accidental. Adding to the sorrow in July 2020, Nick Gordon, Bobby's former fiancé and the person who discovered her lifeless body, also succumbed to a suspected substance overdose. Bobby Brown, the father of Bobby Christina, later alleged that Nick was implicated in the deaths of both with Whitney and Bobby by providing them with substances. However, many fans dismissed these accusations, suggesting that Bobby Brown might be deflecting attention from his own role as he was the one who introduced Whitney to Nick. Fans argue that focusing solely on Whitney's substance use and how she obtained them misses the larger picture. They suggest we should scrutinize those who profited from her demise. Now, attention is turning towards Clive Davis, with some fans even speculating that his pre-Grammy party was a sinister ritual. If these individuals profited from Whitney's career, what could they they possibly gain from her death. Make you cry if you really love music and if you really love Whitney Houston. And then after a couple of joints, you will find it hilarious. Mm. Because, not because you're happy that she's falling apart, it's just she's doing the crackhead antics so dope. You know what I mean? It was, she was in it. Huh? Yeah. It's my key. Uh, like she uh. When delving into the realm of iconic stars such as Whitney Houston, Michael Jackson, and Prince, an intriguing phenomenon emerges. Their value often skyrockets posthumously. This is because upon their demise, their music catalog experienced an unprecedented surge in sales. Furthermore, these celebrities are often unable to assert complete control over their own musical legacy, as labels and other stakeholders maintain significant influence. Take, for instance, Clive Davis, whose net worth as of February 2024 stands 
stands at an impressive $900 million, firmly establishing him as one of the wealthiest figures in the music industry. It's essential to clarify that Davis's wealth isn't solely attributable to the passing of Whitney Houston. Rather, he has meticulously crafted his fortune over an extensive period. Yet, amidst Whitney's aficionados, there persists a conviction that Clive bears some shadowy connection to her demise. They echo Kanye West's prior cautionary notes, suggesting a nexus between the two. Now the focus shifts to Diddy, reminiscent of a recurring motif. Artists and associates in his orbit seem to meet untimely ends, evoking a sense of eerie familiarity akin to deja vu. And even if they did figure out a way, I'm still not backing down from what I said. You know, out in Hollywood, a lot of people come up missing. Feels like it might be a lot of that in order to control, traumatize. They want to monetize and traumatize. And God loved me. Recall the enigmatic departures of Biggie and Kim Porter and the lingering specter of the alleged Tupac saga. Let us explore further. Jaguar Wright has recently ignited a discourse with her startling insinuations regarding Biggie's demise. She intimates that behind the facade of happenstance lies a calculated maneuver orchestrated by Diddy and the machinery of Bad Boy Records. It's remarkable how Diddy has been profiting from Biggie's legacy for longer than the iconic rapper ever graced this earth. Can you believe it? Biggie hadn't even reached 20 and now it's been over 25 years since his untimely passing. Yet Diddy is still rolling in the dough off his name. It's a point worth emphasizing. Diddy has been capitalizing on Biggie's brand for a longer period than Biggie himself lived. It's been more than a quarter century, and Diddy is still riding the wave of Biggie's fame. It raises questions about the ethics of profiting off someone's legacy, especially when that person was taken from us too soon. Biggie's talent was undeniable, and it's clear that even in his short time on this earth, he left an indelible mark that continues to generate wealth for others. Wright is filled with curiosity about the album commission that Biggie was deeply involved in before his untimely passing. She ponders the fate of that album, recalling that it had been meticulously recorded and was in the process of being mixed and mastered when Biggie tragically passed away. The plan was for it to hit the shelves that summer following the release of Biggie's own album, which had already been scheduled. You know, let's see. What happens if I put in Whitney Houston, Kazakhstan? Mm. That's what she, that's what she wants. However, fate had other plans. Biggie's album debuted just a week and a half after his demise, leaving the release of the commissioned album hanging in uncertainty. It was meant to mark Biggie's departure from Bad Boy Records, signaling the beginning of his own venture. Now let me share something rather unsettling. It takes a curious turn as we delve into the eerie details. Have you ever noticed the unsettling correlation between the number of deaths associated with Diddy, particularly during the Uptown Records era? Uptown Records started with five people, Andre Harrell, Al B. Heavy D, Diddy, and Kim. Moreover, Kim was there from the beginning. As of now, Kim is dead, Heavy D is dead, Andre Harrell is dead, the only two left are Diddy and Al, and Al almost died. But here's the real kicker. They all share a common thread. Both the survivors and the departed of Uptown Records were in the process of penning tell-all books. Strange, isn't it? Like anything with her name on it is strictly for the purposes of financial gain for those who have access to her estate, including Clive Davis. Most including Clive Davis. Clive Davis. This ain't a film to celebrate Whitney Houston. This is a film to, uh, you know, Pay to, pay to, pay to pipe. Before his passing, Andre was in the midst of composing a book. Similarly, Heavy D was diligently crafting his own literary work prior to his demise. Kim Porter, too, was immersed in the process of creating a book before her untimely departure. Meanwhile, Al B was engaged in the production of a documentary chronicling his life, only to find himself slipping into a coma. Reflecting on these events, one cannot help but ponder the fate of Diddy. Has he ever faced such dire circumstances? It appears he may be the sole survivor from the early days of Uptown Records, a fact that prompts astonishment and contemplation. Let's take a trip back to 1991, inside a humble gym nestled in Harlem's basement. What began as a well-intentioned basketball charity event organized by the then-fledgling promoter Diddy spiraled into a harrowing tragedy. Imagine the chaos. A frenzy erupted as thousands clamored to catch a glimpse of celebrities like Boys, Two Men, and Heavy D participating in the game. By the evening of December 28, 1991, the scene had turned dire. Nine souls had tragically lost their lives, with at least 29 others suffering injuries amidst the overcrowded gymnasium, bursting with over 3,000 attendees, far beyond its capacity. In the aftermath, whispers and speculations circulated, suggesting dark motivations behind the catastrophe, with some even insinuating that Diddy had orchestrated the event for his own gain, sparking rumors of sacrifices made in pursuit of wealth and fame. Gene, a former security worker for Diddy, had repeatedly cautioned him about the potential chaos at the entrance, urging him to take necessary measures. However, Diddy remained indifferent to the warning. 
things. Then in 1991, there was the Heavy D and Puff Daddy celebrity basketball game. City College tragedy. Right. You were doing security that night. Yes, I that was. That day, actually. Yeah. Yeah. All right. What happened was that Puff first hired 18 of my guys to do the job for the outside. That's what we did, the outside of clubs. You know, people, we did it for Tim Dognum, all the uptown parties and everything. So we shows up and I I see that the, that the people was already crowded out there and it was crazy. So I flew my way in there, me and uh, Slicknum. I said, yo, I told Puff right then and there. I say, Puff, if they don't do a boxing one outside and get these kids off the door, somebody gonna die tonight. He said, Gene, don't worry about that. As the event unfolded with separate lines for advanced ticket holders and those purchasing at the door, the sluggish process frustrated attendees. Tempers flared, leading to fights. And when the doors were finally closed, pandemonium ensued outside. The crowd surged forward, breaching the entrance and causing mayhem. Windows shattered and the situation quickly spiraled into a disaster. Survivor Jonas recounted her harrowing experience, describing how she was violently pushed through a glass window with people trampling over her. Amid the chaos, she struggled to breathe, finding refuge in a bathroom stall with two friends. There were bodies strewn on the ground, but we managed to cram into a stall and hide until the turmoil subsided, she explained. Reflecting on the ordeal, Jonas recalled a small act of normalcy amidst the chaos, a tangerine she had tucked into her jacket pocket, intending to eat it later. However, amidst the chaos, she never had the chance. When we finally emerged from the chaos, all that remained in my pocket was the peel of the tangerine, she reminisced. She added, it stained my cherished jacket, a stark reminder of that terrifying night which I held on to for years. Meanwhile, at the foot of the staircase, the attendant tasked with checking tickets witnessed chaos erupting as eager attendees attempted to force their way inside. Rather than assisting, they promptly abandoned their post and retreated indoors. Heedless of the fact that the door only swung out, picture the pandemonium below. The throng pressed against the impassable doors, while oblivious individuals at the top continued their futile attempts to squeeze through. It devolved into a scene of mayhem, with casualties strewn across the floor, some some trampled, others fainting, a catalog of chaos. It wasn't until a painful quarter hour had elapsed that anyone grasped the severity of the situation. And to add insult to injury, the basketball game persisted unabated within the confines of the gymnasium. Those inside later recounted feeling suffocated, akin to being packed like sardines against the walls. Here is what Gene revealed about it. Down the stairs, after they broke through the first glass, they got trapped downstairs through the, um, the second door because Jessica had got scared, that was Puffy, Puffy partner at the time, Jessica Rosenberg. She got scared, ran downstairs with the uh, money box and shut the door behind her. And all those people got shut down in there and got trapped. Shifting focus to Diddy's tumultuous journey and the unfortunate deaths linked to it, a pressing inquiry arises. Is Diddy merely an unwitting bearer of ill fortune? Or do these occurrences represent bizarre coincidences in the tumultuous realm of music? The eerie specter of death lingering around Diddy prompts contemplation on potential connections between these events. Moreover, long-standing rumors have circulated regarding the relationship between Clive Davis and Diddy, suggesting that their association transcends mere professional collaboration. Whispers suggest a romantic entanglement spanning a solid five years with scant effort made to conceal their connection. From extravagant soirees to discreet gatherings, it appears these two individuals have been indulging in their vibrant lifestyles. Rumors have surfaced, suggesting that Diddy has also been under Clive Davis's influence, perhaps serving as an intimate confidant. Upon closer inspection, the trajectory seems peculiar. Diddy started as a mere intern at Uptown Records in 1990, faced an early exit in 1993, and suddenly emerged founding Bad Boy Records in collaboration with Arista Records under the ownership of Clive Davis, the mastermind behind acts like TLC, Whitney Houston, and Brandy. Despite Diddy's novice status at the time, Bad Boy Records skyrocketed to success, marking his rise in the industry. Here's the intriguing tale. How did he manage to sway Clive into financing his record label? It wasn't like Clive had full confidence in Bad Boy Records' success. He openly admitted his doubts in an interview. He spilled the beans, revealing that Diddy essentially pressured him, asserting that hip-hop would dominate the top 40 charts. 
Sounds improbable, doesn't it? But Diddy strategically played Craig Mack and Notorious B.I.G. tracks, even when they were still flying under the radar. Witnessing the music landscape shift before his eyes, Clive acknowledged, Sean Combs convinced me that Top 40 would embrace hip-hop. It seemed far-fetched at the time. Yet as he listened to Craig Mack's Flava and Yair and the unknown Notorious B.I.G.'s material, this 21 or 22-year-old visionary foresaw the changing tides of music. Bad Boy Records was Diddy's brainchild. Not exactly Clive's forte, but he still decided to bankroll it. Amidst the flood of new revelations, it appears that we're finally gaining some clarity. Jaguar Wright recently shook things up by alleging that Diddy was reportedly mistreated by his mentor, Andre Harrell, the founder of Uptown Records. Furthermore, she claims that Andre himself was allegedly mistreated by Clive Davis. According to her, my current focus is on Sean Combs. He's exploiting and using music and entertainment for his own ends. She went on to state, From what I've gathered from reliable sources, the gender of his victims doesn't matter anymore. I believe Sean is simply a severe narcissist who thrives on power, manipulation, and control, likely influenced by his mentor Andre Harrell, who was in turn mentored by Clive Davis. She persisted, reiterating her uncertainty about the situation between Andre and Clive. What she could confirm was Andre's bewildering fall from grace, from being the head honcho at Uptown to losing everything to his former intern Diddy. The intrigue deepened as the numbers failed to align. Despite Diddy's consistent praise for Clive, even citing him as instrumental in his early career, recent rumors suggested a darker connection between them. Allegations against Clive himself added fuel to the fire with his revelation about his after years of assuming hetero the plot thickened further, hinting at undisclosed dealings between Clive and Diddy, casting doubt on Clive's motives regarding Andre's downfall. I know you're about to go with this. I think I remember this. Not just the voice. Just everything. The whole show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Following this revelation, Clive made the bold decision to embark on a romantic journey with a man, seeing it as the next chapter in his life's narrative. Fast forward to 1990, he found himself in a committed relationship with a mysterious male doctor, a chapter that concluded in 2004. Clive has been candid about his experiences, expressing, I never experienced shame. Rather, I felt perplexed. He emphasizes the necessity for more discourse surrounding by asserting its validity. Rumors suggest Clive is now happily involved in a discreet relationship with another man, attending events and traveling together under the radar. While the identity remains undisclosed, Diddy appears to be Clive's constant companion at gatherings. Their frequent sightings together, coupled with both being openly gay, strongly imply a profound connection between them. Although their close bond may not serve as definitive evidence, the consistent companionship they share signifies a significant relationship. Clive has been deeply involved with a partner, while whispers surround Diddy's potential closeted status. Amidst this, the notion of a romantic connection between them isn't implausible. Clive, although open about his preferences, hasn't dismissed these rumors, lending them credibility. Diddy remains tight-lipped, but his behavior raises suspicions. Given what we know about Diddy, it's plausible he acquired his traits from Clive, who supposedly influenced him through questionable means. However, repercussions may be catching up with Diddy, prompting speculation about Clive facing similar consequences. Behind the glitz of Hollywood lies a complex web of intrigue, perpetuating an endless cycle of controversy. Make sure to check out some of our other videos on the screen if you enjoyed this one.